Yeah, I just wanted to capture a bit of what um, we've been doing so far. So let's draw a little sketch of what we've got actually configured. We've got a motor um, that is driving a carriage back and forth um, on um, a toothed cable. So we've got a motor over here and a toothed cable. And then we've also got a, an encoder strip that runs parallel to this cable with these little bars on it. And we are reading the bars as we go past to determine the position of our effector. If we um, drive the motor forwards, this carriage moves forwards. If we drive the motor backwards, this carriage moves in that direction. And the, on here is an encoder that is delivering a square wave that has a period that is proportional to the velocity. And you can also, by counting these pulses, figure out what position this, well, we're going to call it printhead, but the effector has anywhere along the bar. Now, what have we been using to control this motor? We've been using the Adafruit um, stepper, or uh, Adafruit motor library. And the motor library has a number of different commands. So um, if you've got an object motor, you can do things like tell it what direction it's supposed to go. Yeah, this is also backwards. If you've got a motor, you can tell it what speed it should be going at. And so the speed is somewhere between 0 and 255. So what speed is going to do, it is going to adjust the voltage that this motor gets using pulse width modulation. So zero corresponds to zero percent on time and 255 corresponds to 100 percent on time in terms of pulse width modulation. So that is just that and um, 100 percent is just that and so anywhere in between you've got some sort of on off pattern for your pulse width modulation. That's what we were using to control it. And the first thing that we tried was the absolute simplest thing that you can do. We set two endpoints, top position and then bottom position. We read the encoder until we hit top position. So encoder bigger than or equal to top position, reverse. And then if encoder is less than or equal to bottom position, reverse. That's all we were doing. A couple of things here. There's there's no accuracy involved in actually where the motor turns around because this motor could be, uh, depending on how much mass you have here, this um, duty cycle is going to change the velocity and the change of velocity is going to change how much momentum it has. And so in between when the encoder hits top position and the time it takes to actually reverse the motor, there is some time that's spent um, changing that magnetic field inside the motor here. And that um, uh, during that time, the motor continues to move and then it starts moving backwards. So you've got very little real control over exactly where this motor ends up getting to. And it's not a very effective way of controlling uh, a DC motor. Uh, well, it's effective, but it's not very accurate or precise. You can't say exactly where it's going to turn and you can't determine with very much precision where that um, that point is going to be. You can you can give it accurate numbers of top position, but you're not going to get a lot of precision out of out of where it actually turns around. So the next thing that we're going to try is something called on off con well, on off control. On off control. That looks a bit like this. We're not going to mess with the speed. We're still going to have a constant speed for the motor, but at least we're going to determine how close we are to our endpoint before um, going off to somewhere else. So here we're going to have a set point. 
that set point might be the top or it might be the bottom. It's just some set point that we want to hit. And here now, if, and then we're also going to have a, um, a, let's call it a buffer. Well, buffer is probably the wrong word. Um, it, but you should, uh, tolerance is probably a better word. So if um, the encoder is bigger than or equal to set point plus a tolerance, then we're going to stop the motor and then we're going to reverse it. Stopping it before, well, I could, could have done that up here too, I don't remember. Else, the encoder is less than or equal to uh, set point minus our um, tolerance, then again, stop, reverse, and if we happen to fall into this tolerance band, then we are going to just stop the motor. However, we'll see that this has some inherent stability, instability problems, depending on the, um, the mechanics of our, of our motor. So remember, we're not changing the speed, so we're not changing how far it goes in any particular unit of time. And if in the unit of time, in the period of time between when we read a step, uh, an encoder count, and then we stop, and then we reverse, and then if it goes below our set point minus tolerance in that time before we read the encoder again, then it'll get into here, and it'll go the other way. And if it gets past our set point plus tolerance, then it'll go the other way. So we get this, um, this instability of, of vibrating back and forth around our set point, if our set point is too wide. If our set point's narrow enough, then we should be able to, or if, if our set point is too narrow, if our set point is wide, then we're definitely going to be able to fall into um, the set point band. But as you increase the precision of your, um, your desired precision, you increase the chance of there being an instability through this algorithm because you've got less ability to hit inside of your tolerance band. So then that leads into a next version of a control algorithm called proportional control in which you actually adjust the speed depending on how close you are or the proportion of error you have between your set point and your actual position. And um, I'll talk about that later, but let's just take a look at what this algorithm looks like in our um, application. Okay, so we set the carriage at the left-hand position, moves back and forth, and there you see it wildly vibrating around the set point. But notice that if I apply some downward force or increase the effective momentum that this carriage has, the vibration reduces until I've stopped it. So depending on your actual physical implementation, that might be enough control. And you'll see that if I try and move it sideways, it tries to return and re-establishes its set point. But it is wildly unstable. Just a little tap will send it into oscillations. And that's the big problem here. So now we can do a couple of things. We can reduce the amount of oscillations by reducing the speed at which we approach our endpoint. We can increase the size of our tolerance. But in any event, we're making a trade off between speed and accuracy when we're using this algorithm. Moves to the right, moves to the left and slowly seeks home. And notice that because now it's moving slower, it doesn't have as much momentum, so it doesn't overshoot its target by nearly as much. So now 
we've got a much more stable endpoint. It doesn't oscillate, but it takes us much longer to get there. So it's the trade-off between speed and stability. Now, let's see if we can improve our accuracy at this lower speed. Traverses to the right, traverses to the left, and then, ah, oh, it's got a tiny bit more, a tiny bit of instability. But I don't have to apply nearly as much pressure here. Just a slight tap, and probably even just putting anything with some mass in it will, will be enough to stabilize it. That's right. So we can improve the accuracy, but as we improve the accuracy, we lose stability around our set point. So um, that's the combination of um, adjusting the speed at which we approach and the accuracy. It's a trade-off between stability and speed and accuracy. Now, how do we overcome that? The way we overcome that is using a different algorithm whereby we adjust the speed as we're becoming coming closer to our set point. And that's called linear or proportional control. And we'll look at that next. Okay, linear control. So in linear control, what you're taking a look at is you're taking a look at your current error which is the difference between your current encoder position and the set point. So what that does is it gives us an indication of how far away from our set point we are. Then what you're going to do is you're going to set your speed to be proportional to that error. So the speed is going to be equal to some constant kp times our error term. Now, we have to remember that speed can only take a certain um, number of different values um, based on um, how we're controlling the motor. And remember, we're using pulse width modulation through the Adafruit motor library. And then by experimentation, I've discovered that about 65 is the lower limit for actually getting any movement out of the horizontal um, axis. And then you can go all the way up to 255 and that will be effectively 12 volts. So you get somewhere between uh, 4 and 12 volts will pr produce movement in your motor. So we just have to remember to normalize this speed, not normalize, sorry, that's not, the, that's not the right word. We have to make sure that we restrict this speed value in between 65 and 255. 65 is effectively 0, 255 is effectively full, is full speed and so that's what we're going to use. So now our speed is either going to be full blast or some value in between 65 and 255. This proportional constant tells you how fast you're going to adjust your speed relative to the amount of error you've got. So if this constant is small, you're going to be making small changes to your speed as you approach your set point. But if this constant is large, you're going to be making large changes, larger changes in speed as you approach your, con your set point. So, what does the algorithm look like? And the algorithm looks like if our error is bigger than zero, then I'm going to set my speed to equal my kp times error. As long as my error is positive, I'm going to adjust my speed based on that error term. Else, error is less than zero, or less than or equal to zero, so then we reverse direction. And we still make the same speed adjustment to our motor, but we have to remember that it is, since we're setting it to this proportion, since the error is now negative, it's going to be negative kp times error. And what that'll do is it will s move fast when the error is big, but it'll move slow when the error is small. And that's the linear control algorithm. Okay, so reset the board and see what it looks like runs through its initialization, 
and snaps right into position with no with no more instability. Now, that makes a big difference. It doesn't have that instability around its set point that the, um, that the on-off control did because we're adjusting the speed and with, uh, with reducing the speed, we get less oscillations around that set point. That is the difference between on-off control and proportional control. You can get much better speeds and much better stability by using proportional control. There are a couple of other things that you can add to motor control. PID control, proportional integral derivative. So proportional is a linear portion. You adjust your, um, your mechanical system based on how, f how much you are in error and you make your adjustments proportional to that magnitude of error. There is also the possibility for using something called the derivative. How fast is my error changing? And I will adjust the amount of control that I apply to my system based on how fast the error is changing. So if the error is changing very fast, I want to exert more control over the system than if my error is changing slowly. So if the error is um, rising very quickly, I want to quickly put some control on the system. But if the error is changing slowly, I don't have to do very much because my error is somewhere close to where it needs to be. And then the last bit is the, over time, how much error have I accumulated? So that's the integral portion of it integrals being areas under the curve. So you can think of the, the, um, the set point is a line and I'm approaching the line and over time, how much error have I accumulated? If I'm accumulating lots of error from oscillations, then I should change my control. Or if I don't have very much error accumulating of time over time, I don't have to change my, um, my input very much at all. And that's the other two por parts of um, uh, PID control. But for now, I think what the next step is will be to apply those changes to my um, y-axis and maybe build a little table here and do some work on mounting objects onto this. And uh, yeah, that will be the next step. So I hope you found that interesting, and um, as always, thanks a lot for watching, and we'll catch you all later. Bye for now.